welcome. I'm Sumera Abdi. You're watching Money, Money, Money. It's all very well for us to advise you on how you can earn, save, invest, and spend better. But how do you actually implement that advice? Take investments, for example. How does asset allocation actually translate from paper into reality? How do you buy recommended funds and schemes directly? And what do you do when an investment goes wrong? Well, in answer to all of your questions, we bring you the practical guide to investing directly. Joining me in this endeavor is Hemant Rustagi of Wise Invest Advisors. And we also have with us two retail investors who would like to transition from theoretical to practical investors. Kamal Kiyursha and Sita Lakshman join in in our studio. Thanks so much guys for joining in. But uh, Heyman, before I get to you for your expert take, I want to ask Sita and Kamal a question. Are you guys avid investors and which is your preferred way of investing? I have been a long term investor, equities, okay. and I definitely now go through my advisor. I have been investing for a long time, but uh, basically with the safer investment options like FDs or mutual funds, SIPs, and nothing more than that. You know, this is great actually, Heyman, because we have two uh, totally diverse risk profiles uh, sitting with us. But for someone who has money to invest today, what is step one? How does he go about, what is direct investing and how can a person go about doing it? When we talk about investing directly, what it really means is, can I cut down on my costs? But here we are talking about something very different. We are not talking about buying something. This is a lifelong process. This is your hard-earned money. So you start investing. So if you have money today, first you need to see whether I can make decision on my own. Because what typically happens for every investor is, if I have 2 lakh rupees to invest, I'll invest it somewhere. Okay, if somebody comes and tells me equity markets are doing very well, the money will go there. Next time I have 1 lakh rupees, somebody comes and says, put money in debt instruments because debt is doing very well. So there is absolutely no process, there is no planning at mm. all. Investment requires you to plan your investment. So if you plan your investment, you know exactly what you want to do with money. For that, there are two options. Either you can do on your own or you can take professional help. So if you feel that you have the capability, that you feel that you can invest on your own, you are familiar with all this process, by all means you can do it. If not, then you definitely have to seek professional help. Okay, Hemant, uh, you spoke about direct investment. Now I have two questions. When I'm investing directly, uh, what are the safety options? And generally when I go through a broker, there are some costs involved also. So in case I go through direct, is there any cost involved? And what are the safety measures for that? When you talk about direct, what it really means is that you have to be familiar with this entire investment process. That means you need to plan your investments. All of us have different goals. All these have to be defined. For each of these goals, we have time horizon, how much time you have to achieve them, what is the target that you have. So this is a process. Okay. The problem is, like I said earlier, main, many of us you know, start investing in a haphazard manner. So there's no process for, followed there. Of course, the advantage is that you will pay less cost compared to if you go through a distributor. Mm -hmm. The advantage of having an advisor is that you can rely on someone who is a professional. There is obviously some cost involved. The cost is, let me briefly tell you, uh, when you invest in a mutual fund, for example, nowadays there is no entry load. Which, which what it means is, if you invest 1 lakh rupees in a mutual fund, the fund manager will invest entire 1 lakh into the scheme that you have chosen. Thereafter, to manage that money, the fund house will charge you recurring expenses. Now, it is not that the fund house can decide on their own as to how much they want to charge you. SEBI has provided very clearly in the regulation how much they can charge. So there is a cap over there. And it's a different cap for equity fund and, and debt fund. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, in an equity fund, the maximum they can charge is 2.5. In the debt fund, the maximum they can charge is 2.25. Not only this, SEBI has also prescribed which are the expenses that can be charged to you. Now, for example, you have R&T service agents, CAMS and CARVI who provide service to you. Then there is a custodian charges. Then there is investor communication. Okay, and there is a marketing expense. Now, this is what, if you do directly, will not be charged to you. So typically, a marketing expense, which is the brokerage that is paid, around half a percent. So the difference in the cost, if you go directly vis-a-vis -a, -vis a broker, is 50 basis point per year. So if you are going to be investing for 10 years, 15 years, the difference can be as much as 5 percent, 7 percent, and even 10 percent. 
Well, so that difference alone should be able to account for at least partial uh, inflation that we have. But uh, the way I see it, I suppose the only qualification that you need for direct investing is for you to be disciplined. And, you know, that's the one qualification that many of us fail to meet, actually. But, uh, Kamal, you said at the start of the show that you're never going to go back to direct investing. Why is that? Because no one explains when you're trying to do direct what is right for your portfolio, what, mm. what you need to do, how to allocate your assets correctly what's working for you and what tax bracket we are in. How would that be explained if I'm trying to work direct? How do I sort out that? Because I'm not from the financial field. No. I mean, that's not your full-time job. No, I don't understand my finances. So how, do, how can you make it easier for us if you're going to go direct? It's not easy. The best investment for you is what suits your requirement. Now, for that, there are different parameters that you need to see. For example, what is your risk profile? How much time you have to invest your money? What is that you want to do with your money? All these factors have to be looked at. And within that, when you decide equities, for example, now there are so many options available. You have a diversified fund, you have a you know, sector fund. Now, equity is an aggressive asset class, right? You don't have to make it more aggressive by going into mid-cap fund and sector fund. This mm -hmm. is the risk that when you do on your own. Of course, by all means, you save cost. But let me tell you one thing. If you look at an analysis of, let's say, large cap funds, you will find that the difference between the top performing fund and the fund which are the bottom could be as much as 15%. Mm. Okay. So maybe you save 5% and 6%, mm. but if you're sitting in the wrong fund, you actually mm. end up losing much more. And not only that, your portfolio has to be rebalanced from time to time. Now, mm. for example, you start with an asset allocation of 50-50. After one year, it becomes 60 in equity and 40 in debt. Do you bring it back to your original asset allocation or do you allow it to ride on? Most of us have tendency when the money is being made, you don't want to make changes, yeah. right? The best time to invest in the market is when the markets are down. So when you do rebalancing of your portfolio, which is what an advisor will tell you how to do, which means you will pair your exposure to equity when the markets are high and when you invest money when the markets are down. Yeah. So I think, like I said, you have to make a decision that if you feel confident that, yes, I can take care of my hard-earned money, at the end of the day, we slog, we work hard to earn this money. And if you can't do justice, I don't see any reason why somebody should go direct just to save 50 basis point a year. All right. So that's, uh, you know, very optimistic, actually. And that's some advice we hope that uh, is going to stick with you. But what we'll do now is take a very quick break. We'll come back in a bit. On the other side, we'll continue our discussion. We'll also tell you which are the best ways for you to be investing online directly. Stay with us. We'll be back in a bit. Welcome back. You're watching Money, Money, Money. With me today is Hemant Rustagi and we also have with us Kamal Kiyosha and Sita Lakshman in our studios. We've been talking about the pros and the cons of investing directly. But Hemant, when we talk about investing directly, the first question that everyone wants to know is, can someone just, uh, you know, once they've zeroed in on the mutual fund that they want to buy, can we just log on to the website and buy it? Is it as simple uh, in uh, practice as it is in theory? Yeah, fortunately, yes, you can. I mean, you definitely have an option of you know, going on to the website of the mutual fund. Most of these fund houses insist that you must have a folio number, which means that the first investment that you make has to be offline. The reason for that is because you need to generate one folio number. Once the folio number is generated, then you can start investing online. So what typically happens is you go to site, you get a PIN number for that, for that folio. Thereafter, you can start investing. So typically, there are all the schemes listed. You can select the scheme that you want to invest in. You need to make the payment through net banking. Okay, so you have to have that facility of net banking. Your account should be having that facility. And once you pay the money, once you choose which fund you want to invest in, okay, your investment is on. The difference here is that when you are trying to track your mutual fund portfolio, this fund house is going to give you only performance of the scheme in which you have invested through this mutual fund. So you, you get to see only a small portion of your portfolio there. I'd like to know that how reliable would be the advice by a mutual fund advisor? How biased or real is it? How much can we rely on what they are promoting to us? There are a number of IFAs who also provided this facility on their website. Now what they typically do is they don't have any payment gateway there. 
they provide you a link to the mutual fund site. So if you can go to your advisor's site, find out from them if you are taking advice from someone, whether their their site provides a facility. If it does, okay, you can go on there, then click on that particular facility which is there. It will take you to the mutual fund website. Okay. Now you talked about advice. Uh, clearly, if this is only one way of investing. It doesn't take away that advice that you get from your advisor. So if you believe that your advisor is currently giving you good advice, you can continue to seek that advice. Okay, uh, when I generally log into my bank uh, account online, there are uh, very various options of investing on mutual funds also. So is it okay that I can go through the bank? Is it directly linked with the bank or through the bank it is linked to the mutual fund? Most of the banks provide you this facility of investing online in, in the mutual funds because most of these banks have gone into third party distribution. Now typically what happens when you use your bank website, uh, first they will have their own recommendations. Now these are recommendations which are, you know, not specific to your requirement. The banks also have advisors. So if you really ask your banker, uh, if they are into third party distribution of mutual funds, they will have advisor in the, in the branch. Like I mentioned earlier, you can seek their advice offline and then choose to invest online through your bank site. Now, typically what happens is, if you want to use your bank website, you will have to make a registration for online investment, right? Once you do that, thereafter you can start. You must have an account with that bank. Mm -hmm. Only then they will allow you. The rest of the procedure is, is absolutely same like we discussed earlier. But any charges with the bank? Most of the banks do not charge you anything. Okay. Uh, even if you are, like we men mentioned earlier about using your distributor's website, they also, most of them won't charge you anything. Okay. When you go directly to the mutual fund site also, they don't mm -hmm. charge you anything. Mm -hmm. Except the recurring expenses that we talked about earlier. There are no charges specifically for making online investment. Okay, so these are all interested parties. What about an independent website? Could you use that? Is it safe and reliable? And what about the advice that they give out? Because I've seen a lot of these websites have a lot of advice, but how much of it is of use to a retail investor? The difference here is that you can invest in any number of schemes because it's an independent portal. Mm. The payment again has to be uh, through net banking for all the banks which are registered there. If some of the banks are not registered there, there is also a facility that you can make online investment and the money can be transferred through RTGS okay. or NEFT. So there are different options available. But I think the advantage here is that you can buy any number of funds, but while making payment, for every investment, you need to make a separate net banking payment. Okay. Okay. Now, if we earlier talked about uh, you know going through the mutual fund side, the problem is, if I want to invest in five different funds, I need to have five different pins. Oh. I need to be then logged on to five different sites. Mm -hmm. At at no point of time, I will have one portfolio statement. The advantage here in these portals is they also give you your mutual fund statement, which means you can actually see how your portfolio is performing. So in that case, I mean, logically speaking, then would a DMAT account and investing through a DMAT account score over all of these other options? Well, I think that's a slightly different option. You see, all these options that we looked at, okay, you're not using a DMAT account. You're just making online investment. Now, even these guys will give you advice, okay? Mm -hmm. They will have some scheme listed. They will have advisors. They will also maintain your portfolio. So the advantage in using a DMAT account is that you don't have to do any paperwork at all because you've already done KYC with the broker. Mm. You don't have to do KYC again. Payment mechanism, you're already familiar with that. So I think it's, it's simpler. And another advantage here is if you want your physical holdings to be converted into DMAT, even that can be done. Whereas in other options, uh, you know, unless you can combine all the folios into one, mm. okay, they will always be online and offline. All right, so Sita, have we managed to uh, convince you to go your uh, go independently? Yes, I'm convinced and I think I will go independently. What about you, Kamal? Would you reconsider? No ways, no ways. <laughs> My broker is the best. <laughs> all right, so this is all great for a discussion, but Kamal is not going back. So that's two sides of the coins. But thanks very much, ladies, for joining us in Thank our you. studios today. Hey, Mant, um, we need you to stay back a little bit longer. There's lots more on the show. So that was our practical guide to investing. But where do you go if you have any grievances? Did you know that the offer document contains the name of the person you may approach for any queries or complaints? If the complaint still remains unresolved, investors may approach SEBI for facilitating their redress. So you need to write to the Office of the Investor Assistance and Education. We need to take a very quick break on that note. We'll come back in a bit. On the other side, we have a viewer call-in segment, Can I Afford It?
Welcome back. You're watching Money, Money, Money. Now, health insurance, commonly known as MediClaim, is something which is very crucial. But at the same time, the fine print is as confusing as it is fine. But with sky-high medical costs, you really want to be reading the lines and all of that that's in between. Malasi Galani is here with Mythbusters and she'll decode all that you need to know about health insurance. Over to you Malasi. That's right. You have to read the fine print before you get started. Because if you think you can start a family once you have your medical policy handy, that will cover all the maternity expenses, you're highly mistaken. Some policies exclude pregnancy and costs related to it completely, while others require a waiting period for three years. And the rest cover just the first pregnancy. Secondly, not all health insurance policies are cashless in the true sense. That's a very common misnomer in every hospital will treat you for free once you produce the policy. Because even if your insurance company is a part of the hospital network, you may at times have to pay up the entire amount on patient's admission. The claim desk at most hospitals is not operational 24-7. And therefore, if you're being hospitalized at the time when the insurance desk is not active, you have to pay up upfront. And that comes from a personal experience. Lastly, some policies do not cover cosmetic surgeries, joint replacements and dental treatments, while some others cover just the basic cost. For example, if your eye operation costs you 80000 your policy would cover just a bare minimum of 20000 and you have to pocket the rest. So when you opt for a Medicaid policy, scan through the terms and conditions very well. With that, it's over to you. All right, Manasi, thanks very much for that. I know that I'm going to be going back home and reading through my insurance policy a little bit more carefully this time around. Well, with that, it's now on to can I afford it. If you're looking for a bit of extravagance in your life, well, we're the people to call and I expert will tell you if you can afford it or not. First up, calling us is Arun Roy, who's on the line with us from Kolkata and he has holidays on his mind. Hi, Arun. Where are you planning to head? Yeah, so uh, basically, uh, see, I'm looking for a three-week uh, backpacking trip across Europe. So I've been working for a few years now. Uh, so be, I was paying off my student loans, so I don't have too many savings. But uh, my uh, employer takes care of my mediclaim and uh, uh, other insurance-related issues. And my monthly income is approximately 1.2 lakhs. All right. So how much is this trip going to cost you and how are you planning to pay for it? Yeah, so my estimate would be uh, that uh, it's going to cost me around 3 lakhs and uh, I've been saving up some money since uh, January, so by June I should be able to save up the entire amount. Alright, Hemant, what's the verdict? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a great idea to blow up all your savings on going to Europe. I feel he should not go. He can wait for a year. He must create some kind of emergency reserve so that in case any financial existence is there, he can handle it. All right, Arjun, I'm sorry, but that's the advice for you. You really need to push back your holiday plans for a little bit longer. But up next, Chetali Shah calls us from Mumbai. And Chetali, I believe, is looking to buy her dream bag. Hi, Chetali. Yeah, I want to buy like my dream bag, which is an LV. Basically, it costs 65000 And um, I want to know if I can afford it. I'm currently earning around 85000 per month. And I'm 27 years old. Okay, so do you have any savings or investments? And how are you planning to pay for this bag? Um, yeah, I have around 1.75 lakhs as um, bank FDs and mutual funds. I also have an insurance policy. So I actually was planning to pay via credit card and then probably repay the amount over a period of six months. Hey man, can we let Chetali go shopping? Uh, no, no, not really, because out of a total investment of 1.7, we can't be spending 65,000. And like I said earlier, it's very important to create emergency reserve, and I will never recommend using credit for, for leveraging. All right, Hemant, he's a tough taskmaster, Chetali, but you've got to take his advice. All right, finally, we have an email query from Abhishek Agnihotri, who also writes to us from Mumbai. He's looking to buy an Apple Pro laptop costing about 1.25 lakhs as it will help him professionally, he says. So here are his details. His family income is about 2 lakhs. Expenses stand at 90,000 a month. He pays about 25,000 as annual premium for life insurance and another 8,000 as health insurance premium. He has a car EMI of 21,000 per month as well and has 8 lakhs as total investments plus savings. So he plans to actually dip into his savings month. 
uh, for this purchase. But since it's going to augment him professionally, uh, can we give him the go ahead? Yes, you know, the total portfolio is around 8 lakhs. And, and the most important thing is that if this is going to help him professionally. I think he can go ahead. All right, so finally an approval from Heyman. Congratulations, Abhishek. You can go ahead and buy a professional laptop. But viewers, do remember that if you'd like your friends or family to be featured on our show, you can write to us on money, money, money at network18online.com. You can also find us on Twitter. Write to CNBC TV 18 News and use the hashtag money. We'll see you again next week. But Heyman, thanks so much for being on the show with us today. But, uh, you know, this has nothing to do with the show. But do you like Anne Rand? Oh, yes, I've read the Fountainhead. Well, she's the one actually. So I want to actually sign off this week with a quote from her, which is quite pertinent to today's episode. She says, Money is only a tool. It will take you wherever you wish to go, but it will not replace you as the driver. Take care. Keep investing. I'll see you again next week.